Okay, we're on, I guess, page 361. This is chapter 32, verse uh, 8. And we are uh, talking about Jacob's preparations for his meeting with Esau. Now, I want to just give you a piece of deep background here, and I hope I can live up to it. But it's important to know, when we left Egypt, on the way to Sinai, we were attacked by a band of Amalekite soldiers, the Amalekite army, and there was a battle. And the uh, Torah tells us that Yeshua was successful in weakening that army. The Swarm tell us that this wasn't an isolated incident. They remained weakened for 100 years, hundreds of years, permanently, permanently weakened by interaction with Yeshua. And that means that hundreds of years later, when Shaul set out to carry out the mitzvah of dealing with them, they were already weakened. <clears throat> and it means that in the future, when we will finish the job vis-a-vis -vis Amalek, they're still in that weakened state from that original battle that they had with Yeshua. Events in history don't get lost. They have a permanent effect on, on the world. So, we are told that the last, well, an important interaction on the way to the, the Mashiach establishing his, his kingdom <coughs> is a final confrontation with Esau. You say it every morning. The saviors will go up to the Mount of Esau, and Hashem will then be finally the king. So we have to understand that this interaction that we're reading about here prepares for that. It's setting the groundwork for that. When that happens, we'll be able to look back and say, aha, this is what happened with Jacob and Esau. That's why we're in this and this condition. These be them now. And that's why the ultimate uh, uh, denouement, they say in French, the ultimate uh, uh, upshot of the interaction with Esau will take that in that form because of something that happened thousands of years ago. So we're not just reading about history now. We're reading about an interaction that changes the dynamic and that dynamic then becomes the source of the ultimate confrontation. Okay, so now let's take a closer look at the verses. <coughs> we saw that he split it to two camps, and I told you the two camps didn't include his family. Um, and then he prays to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So this is on page 363. Sorry, this is verse 10. Yeah, sorry. Doesn't want to kill Esau, right? Like that—that that should be uh, part of. Uh, hmm. Doesn't want to kill him. Hmm. Interesting question. I didn't think about that before. He does say, "By Yira Yaakov, a and we said, "I'm afraid Shema, I'll be killed, or Shema, I will kill him." He certainly doesn't want to do either one. And I think that were it to come down to a choice between the two of them, I don't think it's rash to suppose that he would rather kill Esau than be killed, especially since you have a mission to preserve your life and so forth and so on. So I think he would prefer a peaceful outcome. And I think that's right also. I think, I think that's correct. So let's see how he addresses the Kodesh Baruch and we'll see what, how Rashi explains it. Um, uh, 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 and Jacob said, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, Hashem, so we already saw Rashi on that, because you made me two different promises in two different languages. I'm referencing those two promises now. Ha'omer Eli, yeah, who said to me, return to your land and to your birthplace and I will do good to you. So, he's citing his interaction with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, right? There was a dream when he was told to go out, and Kodesh Baruch Hu said, I'll watch you. And now he says, go, uh, go, go home, and I will do good with you. 
So I'm, I have it on record that you have promised me protection and doing goodness with me. Now comes 11. I have been diminished by all the kindnesses and by all the truth that you have done your servant. Well, you promised me kindness, but you already did kindness. A lot. Maybe it's outrun the promise. Maybe I'm in the red now instead of being in the black. And indeed, more than that, what is katonti? I have become diminished. Not bad in English. Katon in Hebrew means small. So it means I become smaller. I don't think that means if you get on the, the scale and, and measure your height and weight that you're going to be, you know, lost two inches in height and lost 20 pounds in weight. So what became smaller? So the commentary has explained what became smaller was his merit. So he's measuring his merit against the amount of the promise. Which then means that the promises might be conditional. They're not absolute. And that gives us a very important insight into promises in the Torah. Let's read Rashi. Let's see how he says it, and then we'll... And then we'll um, 11, at the bottom of the page. I have been diminished by all the kindnesses. My merits have been reduced through the kindnesses and the truth that you have done me. So, there's a, 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 an accounting. And the th even things that are promised need to be paid for. And if you don't pay for them, so then they might not happen. The way Chazal put it is Shem Yigromachet, maybe my transgressions, my failures, my uh, insufficiencies, will cause that the promise won't come true. So you have to know that the promise has a hidden condition to it. Now, I'm stressing this because I don't think there's anything in the verses where the promise is made that would, you give, would give you such a, a, a clue. If I have to learn from here that there's a hidden condition, that means in other places where in the verses of the promise there's no hidden condition, there could be a hidden condition. It's precisely because I learned it here not from the verses in which the promise was made, but in later verses I put two and two together. And I think this is true. I was just having this discussion with, with an eminent rabbi um, when the Torah talks about punishments for Jewish failures. That's conditional on our not doing tshuva because if we do tshuva, the punishments will not, will not take place or the extent of the punishment there are all sorts of other factors that can intervene. The only, the Rambam says this in the Mishnah Torah, in the Uchos Yisodia Torah, Ches and Tes, Tes and Yud, um, the only promise <coughs> which is absolute, which is unconditional, is where a Baruch Hu makes a promise of something good that will happen, and he makes the promise through a prophet to someone else. If it's a promise of something bad, it doesn't have to happen. And if it's a promise of something good to the prophet himself, it doesn't have to happen. That's what we're seeing here with Jacob. It's only when it's a promise of something good to happen to somebody else. So um, that's what we learn from these very important words. I become diminished. Therefore, Rashi continues, I'm afraid, lest since the time you promised me, I've become soiled with sin, and it will cause me to be given over to the hand of Esau. And the promise won't come true. Okay. Now. Now he, he sort of illustrates this, Jacob says, for with my staff I crossed the Jordan, and now I've become two camps. How does that illustrate what he said a moment ago? Mm. He's telling his strategy way, I think. He's giving his war strategy somehow. Like he, strategy? Well, we said that he separated the camp so that he would have a place yeah. to, to, that would come after in case. 
What has this got to do with the Jordan? When did he cross the Jordan? When he went, when he went to Israel. When he went, sorry? When he went. After he separated the camps? He, has, he hadn't gone anywhere yet since, since he separated the camps. They're sitting there waiting for his interaction with, with Esau. No, he means when he left home, and we said he left home penniless. With my staff means that's all I had. No money, no extra clothes, nothing. I just had my staff. And now, I'm separated two camps because I have such a, such a following and such wealth and so on and so on. This is an illustration of the fact that the world has done him great kindness. That's the four. So he says, rescue me, please. And here the Hasid, the, 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 the Mephoshim say, the tzaddikim don't rely on their merits. Please means I'm asking you to do something which you don't have to do. I have no claim against you. So that's why I said the, there's a, a subtle dynamic here. He mentions the promises, and then he says, but I'm not holding you to the promises. Because I recognize that I don't, may not deserve that the promises should be fulfilled. You see, I'm going to say it just a little bit more. The promises are in the background. So if he says to, 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 to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, save me from the hand of Esau, you might think he's doing this on the basis of the promises which he was made, were made before. Jacob wants this negotiation to be absolutely clear. I know you made promises. I'm not holding you to them. I'm asking you to do me something which I may not deserve. He wants that to be all on the table. For I fear him lest he come and strike me, mother and children. I have to check the mother and children. Let's see, 12. <laughs> From the hand of the brother, hand of Esau. So now, you see, this, is, this parallels what we saw yesterday. What, what did we see yesterday? I made a big deal out of it. I told you to read it carefully. Nobody got it because there was an extra word. Well, there it didn't say that. It said, "Go to to to, to Esau to my brother uh, to my brother to Esau." It said an extra two. I told you it's one one letter in Hebrew, the Lamed, right? What do you have here? Yeah, it says from the hand twice. It doesn't just use it in a positive from the hand of my brother Esau, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. So again, it's the same repetition. So Rashi says, from the hand of my brother, who does not treat me like a brother, but like Esau, the evil one. He should have been like a brother, and then I wouldn't have had to ask you. Um, yeah. Is, is this related with what we uh, have in the, in the Mahzor in, in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur about the, the Mishnah uh, that take care of me as, as he was as my friend, but even more, like even more, like an enemy, but even more as a friend. I don't know if it's Are you thinking of Im Kabanim, Im Kabodin? I'm not I know what you're referring to. In the Matsurim, in, in yes. the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur thing, there is one brother that says, take care of, of, of my enemy, and I think it's specifically that you're referring to Esau, as, uh, as my um, enemy, but even more as my friend. I mean, you, 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 I have, I have. Because I don't recognize it. Okay. With Esau especially, I, I don't recognize it. So maybe it's in a different, uh, different nusuk than I, uh, from the one that I have. Doesn't sound familiar to me. So okay, I mean, you represent the, you're carrying the banner of the, of the, the you know, the Rambam and the Ran and the Rashba, and, you know, the great, greats of this Friday world. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it says, and you had said, I will surely do good with you, and I will make your offspring like the sand of the sea, which is two numbers to be counted. This, let's see how Rashi says it, before I sound off. Look at Rashi, 13. I will do good. Doing good will do good. Doing good through your own merit. I will do good through the merit of your father's. 
So <coughs> it's doubled. I have some merit, but if not me, then the merit of my father should stand me in good stead. I will make your offspring on the sand of the sea. Where did God say this to him? Did he not tell him only your offspring shall be as the dust of the dust of the earth? Where did he say to Jacob that it will be like the sand of the sea? But God said to him, For I will not abandon you until I have done that which I have spoken for you. And to Abraham he said, I shall surely increase your offspring like the stars of the heavens on the sand of the seashore. So he, he means, when he says, when, 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 uh, when it's mentioned that what God said about Jacob, one of the things about Jacob is that he inherits the blessings of his father and grandfather. So the statements that, uh, that were made to them also apply to him. Now, I don't remember if I ever told you this before, but these are three comparisons that are made for the Jewish people to the stars of the, of the, of the heavens, to the earth, the soil of the earth, not dust. I've told you before, that's a mistranslation. The word is not avak, it's afar. And to the sand of the sea. Those are three different comparisons with three different uh, concepts. All three are supposed to connote innumerability. It's just impossible to come to a number. But they have three different um, uh, contexts and three different messages. The stars of the heavens are untouchable, unreachable. They give light. They're awesome. <coughs> Inspiring. That's one context. The soil of the earth, everybody walks on it. Everybody walks on it. But that does not reduce its um, fertility one whit. You can have tanks drive over the ground and plant a seed, and it will grow just as well. It won't have any effect at all. So there's a picture of the fact that we may be trampled upon, but our fundamental powers will not be affected thereby. And the say of the seashore, our picture, the picture of the verses in the Tanakh is that the sea wants to reconquer the land. Remember, when the world was created, it was entirely covered by water. The waters had to be drawn off to let the dry land appear. That's explicitly in the verses of Genesis. Well, they don't like that. They'd like to come back and reconquer it. This is what's in the spirit of a tsunami. What is a tsunami? The water rises up 100 feet and smashes against the shore. The sand at the seashore holds it back. One of the things that the Jewish people does in this world is to hold back the forces of evil, which are there. They're there, but they have to be held back. And now, having said all of that, I will go one step further and offer a, a thought of my own which is either true or false. In cellular biology, the cell has in it thousands of molecular machines that make various products. And like many machines, they have um, uh, throwaways, leftover, leftovers from the mechanical process. And they are garbage. And there is a, uh, a, a, an area in the cell which has a membrane to which all the garbage is sent. It's, it's stored in that membrane. And when there is a signal sent out from the cell that it's being attacked by some kind of disease which would make it dangerous, a signal comes back to the cell and says, commit suicide. And it does. It dissolves that membrane, and the cell is flooded with the garbage and dies. So every cell carries with it a death packet, which is held back by a membrane. And if something attacks the membrane, then it dies. I think that's a microcosmic uh, um, sketch of our world. Our world has evil in it. And there's a barrier that holds it back. But if uh, things aren't arranged in an appropriate way, then the barriers are removed. The flood also was produced by waters welling up from the earth. It wasn't just that it came down from heaven. So, that's the, the, the three comparisons. So, he says, this was the, what I was promised. And now, um, I think this goes together with what I told you the other day, 
that he's really not worried about his family because his family is guaranteed. Those are the promises that he had from God that he would be the, the, the third patriarch. That hasn't been compromised. What might be compromised is his own personal protection. That could deal with his getting back to his father. That could deal to, with, uh, with the wealth that he's accumulated. That's why when he split up the two camps, he split up at the Am Asheri To, the people who are with him, but not his family, because they were with him separately, as I pointed out. So um, this is the plea that he makes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, he doesn't get an answer. That's just how he prays for help. So, he spent the night there and, um, and took... Now, I... Uh, let me just check in the Russia. I'm, I'm saying this correctly. I can't see it. 14. <clears throat> Yeah. I, I believe this, this description of the, of the gift that he's sending out took place in the daytime. It didn't, play, didn't, it didn't play, it take place at night. Anyway, he sends this gift to Esau. There's a lot of detail here. I just want to point out one element of the detail, which I think Rashi points out. Well, let, let's see what it, what it says, and then I'll point it out to you. There's a lot I'm skipping over, is what I'm saying. He took from that which is coming to his hand a tribute to Esau's brother. A uh, gift. She goats, 200, and he goats, 20. Use 200, that's female sheep, and rams, 20. Nursing camels on their young, 30. Cows, 40, and bulls, 10. She duckies, 20, and he duckies, 10. Okay, what's the rule? What's the rule in all these cases with the numbers? More females. More females than males. Mm. Why? Because Esau prefers them. No, he not because Esau prefers, prefers them. Will be more little... That's how you build your flocks. Mm. Males don't bear children. Mm. Only females bear offspring. Mm. You know, the males are only there to impregnate the females, that's all. <laughs> Otherwise, you could do away with them entirely, right? You want a bigger flock. So, of course, there are less males than females. Why the exact proportions are the way they are, I don't know. But the rule, that's the rule. And anyone who de dealt with animal husbandry would know right away that that's the way you want to have it. Um, okay, now. He, he put his, in his servant's charge each herd separately and said to his servants, the, com the commentators are split here, was it many herds, each of which had all of these numbers? Or was it many herds because these numbers were split up into smaller groups? If it's, if it's many herds had with all these numbers, it's a, it's a big, a big uh, tribute. So he said to his servants, pass on ahead of me and put a space between herd and herd. <coughs> Don't arrive at Esau in a crowd. Here he's playing psychology. You can imagine Esau on a hill, and he sees coming over the opposite hill, going into the valley, some people with some animals. And then there's a space, and there's more people with animals. And then another one. <laughs> and then another one. She has four already. And another one. Five. Look at that. Holy mo. Six. You know, it makes an impression. And they're all strung out on a line, and they all approach him, and each one makes an obsequious, bows down, and says, my Lord, and so on and so on. He's playing psychology. And as we saw, I mean, the king, we're putting Esau in the company of the king of Sodom and, and Lavan. You can manipulate them that way because their, their emotions are really ruling them. So, and he, so he said, he said to the first one, when my brother Esau meets you and asks you, saying, who, who, whose are you and where are you going and to whom are these that are before you? In other words, I'm asking about you when I'm asking about the animals. You shall say, you want to know whose these are? They're your servants, Jacob's, your servant. Servant comes before Jacob. It's not Jacob, your servant. It's your servant, Jacob. 
He's essentially, he's your servant, whose name is Jacob. Not essentially, he's Jacob, who happens to be your servant. No, essentially, he's your servant. Is a tribute said to my Lord, little L, to Esau, and behold, he too is behind us. In other words, Jacob, Jacob's not trying to avoid you, Esau. He's not trying to avoid the meeting with you. On the contrary, he's sending this as a prelude to a meeting with you. This means that you want, he wants us to be thinking the whole time. Okay, in three hours, I'm going to be meeting with Jacob. And here's this, and this, and this, and this, and in his mind, preparing to meet with Jacob, these, these gifts are having an effect on him. That's precisely the psychological effect that Jacob wants him to have. Yeah. So it sounded like he had a few blessings to call on, you know, ones that had been given to his forefathers, one that had been given specific to him. In why he chose specifically this one to emphasize, is, he's, is he asking for support in being a bulwark against evil, in this case, Aesop specifically? Oh, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Didn't think of it. I, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. Yeah. So I guess I have a question. I remember seeing in, I guess, an alternate interpretation of like the stanzas to the Earth of Dreams, oh, yeah. which being like, um, I think you like touched on it a little bit as far as um, the um, the Jews that aren't exactly doing what they're supposed to be doing at this point. Um, Jacob like sees himself as, but he's not really uh, fully aware. Oh. Mm. Could there be like an aspect of that to it, perhaps? Maybe. Maybe. So that's the same thought. Yeah, yeah. And just, uh, is he kind of assumed that uh, it's, uh, like, we, we said before that it's Hak's bracha, needs to be, uh, Jacob is saying that the, my father's bracha didn't actually actualize in me. Hmm. And, and it's making the whole um, inverted function, no? Like he's being actually, uh, as if Esab received the bracha, right? That's, that's what I think we mean. Because I am under your name, like the whole, like, is it kind of... Uh, I just put this in. I always forget to do this. Let's try it again. I, I didn't get it. Like, uh, is it kind of implied that uh, it seems to be that Jacob is telling to Esau that actually it's as if Esau received his father's oh. bracha because he's acting as if, as if um, actually Esau would have received the bracha? Since he's like under his neck, like the whole thing seems to be like... Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, that's nice. That you can put that together as another example of that. Because one part of the bracha was having vir lachacha. You should be a lord to your brothers. And he's now saying that he's his servant, so he's acting out that he didn't get the bracha. That's a very nice thought. That's a very nice thought. I think, let me just check if, if Rashi says that. <coughs> um... So let's try. Let's take a look at 19 in Rashi, uh, page 367. You shall say, your servant... Your s One second, let me check the... Uh, what? Yes. It's... it's the, the, the double lama is here too. For your servant, for Jacob. Answer the first question first. The last question last. As to what you asked... To whom do you belong? You, the person, say, I belong to, to, to your servant. Uh, uh, as Uncle says it. As to what you asked, whom are these before you? I answer, it is a tribute sent. That's so interesting. Who do you belong to? Now, if he says, I belong to Jacob, the message is, oh, so Jacob has things. In particular, he has, he has slaves, right? But if, I, if he says, I belong to your servant, well, then I belong to you because my, my master is your servant, and then in that respect, I would belong to you also. He's not, so he says to your, uh, to, to, uh, to, to your servant. Now he says, what about the animals? He could have said, well, they belong to, to your servant also, and I'm sending them over. He doesn't answer that way. According to Rashi, he doesn't answer that way. But he says, they already belong to you. They're given to you. I'm just transporting them. But the gift is already, is already finished. They don't belong to your, servant, to your servant at all. He's not offering to give me to you, says the servant. Right? 
not offering you that you should acquire me as a slave. He's sending the animals to you. But since that's the case, I'm not going to say they belong to him. They already belong to you. Very delicate. Um, but he doesn't say what... Uh, uh, what uh, we said. Okay. So now... That's the first that message he gave to the first one of the, of the servants who's taking his, his herd of animals. 20, he similarly charged the second, also the third, as well as all those who followed his herd, saying, oh ho, so there's more than three. It's at least more than three. In this manner shall you speak to Esau when you find him. And you shall say to him, okay, I gave you the first message, now I'm going to give you a second message. Moreover, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. And that, so now they say that's the end of the speech. And now the next, next words are a parenthetical re remark about Jacob's own self-talk, his soliloquy. For he said, Jacob said, I will wipe away his furious countenance with a tribute that precedes me. And afterwards I will face him. Perhaps he will forgive me. <coughs> Let me check in the Rashi to make sure that that's the way he explains it. Because it could be that he sent those words as well. As well. So let's check the Rashi. 21. Um, so that's where he starts with. I can't see what I'm looking at here. Um, I will wipe away his furious counters. This means I will, I will uh, neutralize his, his wrath. Similarly, so the, the word here in, he, in Hebrew uh, is very interesting, achapro. You know achapro from Yom Kippurim. Yeah, so then, uh, what does kapora mean? It means atonement? Sure, but you have no clue what atonement means because nobody talks that way anymore. Um, the word kapara literally means cleansing. Wiping away filth. One of the places it says, a person is offering a sacrifice and there's blood on his hands. He says he is machaper, his hand on the lip of the, of the, of the, of the vessel. I mean, he wipes the blood off his hand onto the vessel. So, achapra panav would literally mean, I'm going to clean away his face. Jacob is saying, I'm going to clean away Esau's face. So, we take that to mean, his face shows his anger. And I'm going to wipe that expression from his face, with the gift that I'm sending him. Now, so Rashi now makes a little explanation. All kapara that we see in the case of crime, uh, in terms of sin, uh, sin and transgression, or association with face, countenance, all mean wiping away or removal. That's why the Aramaic translates it that way. He says exactly what I said. Okay, I remember it correctly. Okay, so now I just don't know the Tamun I don't know. I, I'm not convinced. I don't know. I don't know whether it's, I always read it as that's what he said to Esau. Not that it's a parenthetical remark of the Torah. That he said it to himself so as to explain. But okay, I, I, let's, I'm, I don't think it makes a, a big difference. Fine. So now it says in 22, the mincha, the tribute, passed on before him while he spent the night in the camp. So it does sound like he sent it at night. Okay, he's alone. I mean, alone. He's in the, in the camp at night with his, with his family, and the rest of his possessions are split up into two separate camps. Yeah. So I, I don't know why Rashi writes here, your covenant will de with death will be nullified. But there was something really interesting at the start of all this, which was that when... Jacob supposedly sent angels as messengers. Asaph still rode out with 400 men, you know, with the implication that he was ready to do violence, mm -hmm. which is something kind of staggering. And then 
that no, is... no, 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 no. He doesn't recognize them as angels. Oh, I didn't know that. How do we know that? Well, for one thing, um, they behave like people. These are the same, the same angels that came to Abraham, mm. right? And there, well, this, is, this is quite interesting. I won't do the whole thing now, but it's just, there, there's a difference of opinion between the commentators whether Abraham knew that the three who came to him for hospitality were angels or not. One commentator said he didn't know they were angels. So even to Abraham, they appeared like people, right? Mm-hmm. Now let's say he did, they, 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 he did know they were angels. How did he know? How did they look? Well, if they were angels and they looked like angels, why did he offer them food? So those commentators, where I understand them, are saying this. He knew they were angels because he knows things. But how do they look? They look like people. And that's why he, his conclusion was, because Baruch Hu sent me angels. I don't know. You know, why did he do that? Well, they look like people. They're traveling the road, right? They're in the position where normally I would give, I would give hospitality. So I guess I meant to do the bits of hospitality. That's why he sent them. And he offers them food because they look like people who need food. So his knowledge of it is something internal. He has some like signal, but their, their, their appearance is the appearance of people. When they come to, to Sodom and they take up, there are two of them and they're in the, in the square and Lot comes and, and, and petitions have come to his house. He doesn't know they're angels. Mm. He thinks they're people. And for sure, Esau didn't know. Okay. So, and so that, that stymies the thought, but the other, the other pieces were when it said, I will wipe away his face, the wrath on his face, that reminded me all the way back to Cain. You know, why do you have this wretched expression on your face? And then I thought further, it's like, okay, well, Cain similarly is someone who's in defiance of God, just objectively. Yes. And I thought Aesop was looking to provide a similar role here. Ha! <laughs> nice try. <And laughs> nice try. I don't think so. I mean, it's not, what is, it's like, this, these are Jacob's words. Mm-hmm. These are Jacob's words. No, no, you got the, 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 the people reversed. The Jacob words, I see the wrath on Esau's face. Mm-hmm. I want to wipe away the wrath on Esau's face. Oh, I know, I know but I'm, I'm thinking he's trying to prevent Esau from becoming king. Oh, oh that's okay. Let's, let's recalculate again. <laughs> that's very interesting. I think I could credit the motivation. It's, that's very interesting because... When Abraham interacts with the king of Sodom, we went through this then, and he says, I don't want any of your goods. Let it not be said that you made Abraham rich. Mm-hmm. And Rav Desta, from whom I took the whole idea, asks, what is it to Abraham if he'll say that? So he'll say it. So what? We know the truth. Any sane person knows the truth. King of Sodom happens to be insane. Um, he says, no, because his attitude that everything really belongs to him, and if Abraham keeps the things that he has conquered by right, then he's going to be stealing it from him, and he made it rich, that's an element of his wickedness. And Abraham says, I don't want to reinforce his wickedness. And indeed, Abraham pleads on behalf of Stone. Right? He pleads on behalf of God, God should have mercy on them. So even these people who are supremely wicked, Abraham wants to do good to them, wants to help them, certainly doesn't want to add to their, to their liability. So that attitude, I think, is a good attitude. I think you're right about that. Jacob would certainly want not to re- reinforce or perhaps even help his brother overcome the trap that, he, that he's in. So I, th- I think that's a, that's a good thought. I don't think I'm going to fix the details here, but I think the thought is a, is a good thought. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> So this is the message that he sent to them. Now, he spent the night, and he took his two wives, his two handmaids, his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the, of the Yabok, not the Jordan. It's a local river on the way, Yabok. Took with them, brought them across the stream, and brought the horse, that which is his. Now, this is personal effects, all of it. He moved across the stream. Given where Esau is and how he's going to come, the path, will be, they'll be safer, um, uh, 
And Jacob was alone, 25. Left alone. Mm. No, uh, the, the, the English here doesn't do justice. Oh, no. When you say he was left alone, what you mean is he was together with other people and they left him. That's not what it says. Right? He, was, he, he, was, he remained alone. Nosar means re, what remains. And now he has this wrestling match till the break of dawn. So the question is, he, he took over his family and his effects and crossed the Abok River. So he's with them, he's crossing them, and then he's together with them on the other side. How did he end up alone? So look at Rashi. This is a famous, famous thing. <coughs> he forgot some small jars. Small jars. Went back to look for them, back, and back for them. <laughs> jam? Jacob, some jam? Peanut butter? Are we going back for the small jars? <laughs> From here, says Rashi, we see that the righteous treat their property with care so that they should not, um, they shouldn't engage in theft. Um, let me just check the, the actual Hebrew here. I know they, trans they can't quote it, but I'm a little suspicious here. Um, we can't tell you. Well, yeah. <sighs> okay, the words say what they say, even though there's other things going on here. In other words, if a person ha ends up with reduced circumstances, that's a temptation to steal. And that's part of the Yetzirahara, evil inclination. That's part of what gives us the opportunity to exercise free will. <coughs> so he's saying, Sadiqim here care, care about what they have because they want to protect themselves from a reduction of resources so as not to have to face the evil inclination of theft. Now, there's a, there's a strategy built in here which may not be exactly obvious. Suppose someone said this. What are you talking about, Rabbi? They're trying to avoid the temptation of theft? Well, that means they're trying to avoid the exercise of, of free will? Aren't we put here to exercise free will? Why would you want to avoid the Yetzirah? You should want to meet the Yetzirah head on and do battle and win. There's a certain intuition in that. It's just wrong, that's all. <laughs> According to the tradition, Rabbi Sol Salanter said, Chochmas Chaim, life wisdom is how to avoid confrontations with the Yetzirah. We say it every morning, please don't bring me into a position of testing. We're not looking for fights. You know, you say, where shall I buy my house in town? Oh, how about the middle of the red, red light district? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> buy it in the yeshiva area. <laughs> If a Kodesh Baruch wants to test you, he'll manage it. Don't worry. He's not without resources to make it happen. But we don't go looking for it. Now, what happens to the intuition that we had, that since we're put here to make choices, maybe we should look for it? So one, and one answer to it is this. It goes together with the fact that we pray to a Kodesh Baruch not to be put into the, into the position of being tested. Why are we praying? What's motivating us to pray? because we know what the danger is and we care that we shouldn't fail because failing at this is something that is something which we appreciate the tragedy of and we are uh, committed to avoid it in every way that we can. That's a good deal of what the test is supposed to accomplish and it's already on board. The attitude that I have in praying for divine help not to be tested is because I recognize how precious the mitzvahs are. I recognize how tragic it is to fail. That means I'm in the place where the mitzvahs are supposed to push me. And then maybe the Nisayon isn't necessary. Or certainly less necessary. So, uh, at any rate, the real bottom line here is we don't figure out what a Kodesh Baruch Hu must want us to do given that I know ABC. 
We don't do that. We have a rule book, and we see what he actually said. And if my intuition, the basis of ABC, would say I should seek out tests, and of course, Rogel says don't do it, then we don't do it. Yeah. The, um, the tests that he actually, the tests that he does end up giving us, are, are they tests that we're able to pass? And whether or not we, we, we actually would is one thing, but are, they, are, they a, are we actually able to pass them in some? So the, the, are we always able to pass the test that he gives us? This is a very tricky, it's a very simple question, but it has a very tricky answer. <clears throat> the bottom line here is not every obstacle is a test. Not every temptation is a test. Not every attack is a test. We take your question and we reverse it. We say... The definition of a test is something which I can't overcome. And therefore, if I face an obstacle that I can't overcome, it's not a test. So the answer to your question is yes, but it's yes by definition. So it means that there can be obstacles that they're not capable of overcoming. And then because the definition of a test is something you can't overcome, those obstacles aren't tests. So wait, you're saying the definition of a test is obstacles you can or cannot overcome? Can. Can overcome. Okay. Can. A test is something which, by definition, you can overcome. Because Baruch doesn't cheat, and he doesn't do things just to destroy us. To say that I'm making, you, I'm making you a test, but I've designed the test in such a way that you can't pass, is certainly morally questionable. Like, you know, right? How would you, in certain situations, I mean, obviously some, I, I can imagine, you could clearly be like, this is a test that I can't pass. Mm -hmm. um, just like impossible, like, like physically impossible, let's say. But for other ones, how would you know whether or not it would be a Good question. How do you know? Sometimes you don't know. When we had prophecy, you could have asked the prophet. Mm. But one place where this is brought out in an extremely poignant way, after the Akedah, after God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and he passes the test, of course, we who calls it off at the last minute, but he passes the test, the angel says, for God, I have swore, I swear by myself that you'll have these and these benefits. So the Medrash asks, swear? God is swearing to Abraham? Why is he swearing? And the Medrash says, because Abraham said to God, don't test me again. And don't test Isaac either. Don't test us again. Very, very poignant. He passed the biggest test, one of the biggest tests in the history of mankind. And he said, don't do it again. Meaning, I don't feel that I can stand up to something like that. And uh, I could be crushed by it. So there definitely is the question of facing obstacles that are impossible to overcome. When you will be parents, if you, Hashem, if you will have a normal relationship with your children, you'll face that over and over again. Because one of the things that every parent goes through is that the child is in trouble, and you know what the child needs. And you're right. That's what he needs, and that will help him. But he can't take it from you, because you're his father. And he's 16, and he's at that age where he's not going to be pushed around by his father. You know, he's got to do things on his own. I see some smiles. You recognize that from reading about it in books. <laughs> Not from your own experience, surely. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yes, you have a question. Just, um, I mean, I would like to know, like, where Rush learned the idea of these small jars, like... Uh, Oh, so this is, an, uh, this is an important point. Where does it learn the idea of the small jars? Um, the, the Torah has, has, a, has a problem, right? Now, sometimes Rabbi Rashi will use the rabbinic tradition to answer the question in the text. Sometimes the answer doesn't come from the text. There's no way to know that it was, that it was uh, small jars or meditation or, you know, exercise in swimming the river. Or, <laughs> there's no way to know that from the text. But Rashi won't offer something that isn't needed in the text, unless he says it's a drush. It's not, it's not uh, you know, it's not, uh, yeah. In the case that an obstacle, you know, emerges, which we clearly can't succeed at, but we have no choice and we have to confront it, is the test there maybe to get as far in relation to the obstacle as we can? So that's, that's a thought. You're, you're, this is the right way to think. Okay, so if the test isn't to succeed in overcoming it, what is, what is the test? Mm -hmm. And I think very often the test is, Living with the fact that you can't overcome it. Living with the fact that you have these limitations, these barriers, and living with the fact that you can't overcome it. 
I'll tell you one more thing, then I have to quit. Um, the, the, uh, we know the Medrash that Chosh offered the Torah to all the peoples, and each one said what's written in it, and they were told something that they couldn't, they couldn't abide, and they said they didn't want it. So the Shemish Shmuel asks, would, did the Jewish people have to pass that kind of test also? Were they told something that, so to speak, went against their nature and it would be hard for them to abide? And they accepted it even in spite of that. And he says, yes. What were they told? Now, you could ask this to people with black hats and double-lined black velvet yarmulkes. What were they told that goes against their nature, which would have been difficult for them to overcome and accept it anyway? Hagbil Esahar set boundaries up around the mountain, up to here and no further. You can't go any higher. There's a limit to how far you can go. That's difficult for a Jew to take. And the proof of it is, when we, you all have heard that the, the guy was holding the mountain over their heads. Okay, just do a little mental imagery. You have a mountain. People are surrounding the mountain on the plains, on the flat ground, right? Now God picks up the mountain. Yeah, so is it over their heads? No. no. <laughs> it's in the middle of the circle that they made. Says Rashi, they ran underneath. They ran underneath. They were only told not to go up the mountain. Underneath they could go. Tukul raglecha. It's a pasuk in Hazinu. Because they want to be close. So here's a proof that they want it. So they, to tell them, no, you can't go, to hold back, that was something they had to accept. That limitation was, went against their grain, and they accepted. That's the same Shemish Beautiful, beautiful Shemish